Hey, 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 hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Taking Stock Live. I'm Kalila Reynolds and it's my pleasure to be here with you this week. Sorry I wasn't here last week. That was historic. Four years of doing the show and the very first time I had to cancel because I was sick, popped down, not doing well, but you know, we'll bounce back and I'm here again this week. Happy to be with you. Guys, make sure you join Money Mission because next week I have coming up in the community a webinar called Surviving Christmas. For those of you who are thinking about all the things that you need to spend money on this Christmas, and not just that, but the month after, MAGA season is in January. That's the month that you really need to survive. I'm going to be giving you my tips to survive Christmas and January with some money in your pocket. So make sure you join Money Mission and tune in. The link is in the description. For those of you who were with me last night for Money Marketing, it was awesome. We're now finished all four lessons in the course. And if you missed it, the replays are already available. They're always available as well. Have to go back to <laughs> My phone decided to just jump into the conversation. Well, we have a, a delightful delightful might not be the right word. We have an intense conversation coming up today. We're talking about Guyana and the border dispute with Venezuela, what might be happening there, and also the historic causes. But first, here's a look at what's coming up in tonight's show, followed by what's hot in business. And of course, come on, let's get this money. Here's what's happening on this week's episode of Taking Stock, Jamaica's most influential business show, with me, Kalila Reynolds. The battle is heating up. Venezuelans voted on Sunday to back the government's claim over the oil-rich Essequibo region of Guyana. So what happens next? What does this mean for Guyana? And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Investment icon Charlie Munger has died. We'll take a look at his legacy and how he changed the game. And Coca-Cola's nine-month results are out. How did they perform? We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. The Financial Investigations Division says more than 200 customers were defrauded by Stocks and Securities Limited over several years. In its latest update on the fraud investigation, the FID said some 200 account holders were robbed of more than 30 million US dollars, up from the initial 12 million. Shortly after this announcement, burglars stole five laptops from SSL's main office in Kingston. However, Chief Technical Director of FID, Selvin Hay, says the theft will not affect the investigation. Shipping companies have reportedly paid over 235 million US dollars so far this year to jump ahead of congestion at the Panama Canal. Severe drought conditions have limited the number of daily ship passages along the route. The restrictions, which started this month, are expected to continue until February. The canal's managing authority said trips will drop 50% to 18 per day in the new year. Excluded vessels will likely alter course to the Suez Canal, which will add at least a week to the journey between the U.S. and China. Edufolk will be looking to raise more funds in the new year through a rights issue. Shareholders voted to approve the rights issue and a stock split at the company's recent AGM. No details have been released yet on the size of the rights issue or stock split. Earlier this year, Edgefocal announced its plans to expand to Africa and the United States. Social media platform TikTok just became the first non-gay mobile app to surpass the U.S. $10 billion mark in consumer spending. According to analytics data.ai, users have spent over $10 billion on the app since 2016. TikTok has seen an unprecedented surge in consumer spending, adding nearly four billion US dollars to its revenue this year alone. Surpassing this milestone moves TikTok up the ranks alongside gaming giants such as Candy Crush Saga and Clash of Clans in consumer spending. What's Hot was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Are you ready to make money on social media? If you're an influencer, content creator, or small business, here's how you can use social media to get paid. Level one, build your community. Level two, connect your community with products and services that they want. And level three, sell products and services directly to your community. 
Seems simple enough, right? But there's method to this madness. I'll teach you all my strategies in lessons three and four of money marketing, including how to find clients on social media, how to pitch yourself or your services to other businesses, and I'll even give you my personal contract templates. Check the comments for the sign up link. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back. Welcome back to Taking Stock. Let me see who we have online. And guys, let me know what part of the country or what part of the world you are joining us from this week. Let's check the comments. Starting with David from Mabay. Big up yourself, David. We have Francine watching from Richmond, St. Anne. Kish says, good evening. Who else? We have Dwight all the way from Spanish Town. We have KB in, from Cayman who says he's in the house. Uh, Lanesra saying, welcome back. Damar says, big up KRM. And we have Kevon in Portmore. So thank you guys. Looking forward to our conversation this evening. And our guest is joining us actually all the way from Guyana today. Because as you know, if you've been watching the bottom line on TikTok or on Instagram, or if you've been following international and regional news at all, you would know that Guyana is on track to become one of the largest oil producers in the world. But there is just a tiny problem. Venezuela is now claiming two thirds of the country as its own, even in the and with the oil rich region of Essequibo being the center of the dispute. So joining us now, we have journalist at the Guyana Times, Jarrell Bryan. Hi, Jarrell. Hi. So we Good have evening. a little. We have a little echo going on, so just bear with us this evening. I think Jarrell is in a big room and his voice is carrying. But Jarrell, can you just start out by setting the stage with us? Give us a brief history of this dispute. Okay. Um, first thing to know is that um, it's not so much a dispute as it's a controversy. The dispute was settled in 1899. Um, there was an arbitration panel that reviewed all of the evidence Guyana presented its case. But, well, back then it was British Guyana. Venezuela presented its case, and the arbitration panel ruled that um, SPO belongs to Guyana. So the, the controversy only came about as Guyana was approaching independence. Venezuela suddenly, they had previously accepted the border. And as we were approaching independence in 1966, they suddenly um, decided that the 1899 arbitral award was null and void. Um, so that's where we are today. But um, the case is before the ICJ, International Court of Justice. So, yeah. So you mentioned the 1899 ruling, and there's also something that happened in 1966, an agreement in 1966. Give us some background on what these two things are and why each side is referring to a different thing. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. So there are two pieces of legislation at the center of the ruling. Well, I don't know if it's legislation. One is the ruling from 1899, and then you have an agreement from 1966. So tell us about this and why both sides are using one or the other. Okay, so the 1899 Arbitral Award, that, um, that effectively decided the borders between Ghana and Venezuela and that Essequibo would belong to Ghana. Now, the 1966 Geneva Agreement came about because of the objections Venezuela raised to the 1899 Arbitral Award. So the only reason Venezuela stopped accepting the 1899 Arbitral Award was because of um, because of a letter that was written by the last surviving Venezuelan member of that team, that 1899 team. He died in 19... 49. But before he died, he wrote a letter alleging that um, there was collusion um, during the 1899 arbitral award and Venezuela was cheated. Um, he didn't provide any evidence. Venezuela took that letter and ran with it. 
they've never provided any evidence, but because of the confusion that Venezuela was kicking up at the time, um, British Guyana, everyone decided, okay, fine, we're going to have this Geneva Agreement, this 1966 Geneva Agreement, in the hopes of settling this controversy in a peaceful manner. So that's how the 1966 Geneva Agreement came about. It was a way of settling the controversy. And if the, contro if the controversy could not be settled, the Geneva Agreement catered for it to be, um, to be referred to the International Court of Justice, which is what happened in 2018. It was referred. It was referred to the International Court of Justice after failed negotiations. There was a 27 period where both sides were talking. No, um, no progress was being made. So the UN decided to refer it to the um, to the International Court. So what happened in 2018? You hearing me? Okay, our guest's uh, internet communicate internet connection seems to have gone. But yeah, this dispute has been going on for over a hundred years, as you can hear, you know, from the background that he was just giving us. So you had the 1966 Geneva Agreement, and that's an active treaty between Venezuela and the United Kingdom. It outlines steps that uh, could be taken to resolve the territorial dispute between Venezuela and the UK over the Essequibo region. And Essequibo is a region that takes up two thirds of Guyana's entire land. Hello? I think he's back on with us. Yes, Jaril, yeah. you're having some internet connections there. Glad to have you back. So I was asking yeah. what happened in 2018 when it was referred to the ICJ? Okay, so um, up until that point, 2018, um, Ghana had been continuing to have dialogue with Venezuela under the, the watchful eyes of the UN. Um, and we weren't getting anywhere. And throughout that period, Venezuela has been um, displaying aggression towards Ghana. There was, at one point, Ghana was about to get a major investment a US $300 million investment, um, aerospace. And because of Venezuela's threats and so on, Venezuela basically annexed Guyana according to its constitution in 1999. So Venezuela has for a long time been trying to scare away investors. So it's against that backdrop and the the negotiations not going anywhere that Ghana decided enough is enough. And we sought the UN to refer the matter to the World Court and the UN did just that, which is catered for in the 1966 Geneva Agreement. But I'm Venezuela asking- Venezuela has been claiming that mm -hmm. the 19- Sorry, go ahead. What, so what was the outcome? It was referred well, the to case the is, is still um, in the case is still before the ICJ. Mm. The, the, the case is still before the ICJ. What has been happening is we've been dealing with preliminary matters. Venezuela uh, raised objections to the ICJ um, covering the case. They claimed the ICJ did not have jurisdiction. Twice they raised objections. Both times the ICJ ruled that they do have the jurisdiction to deal with the matter. And then most recently, um, Guyana had to approach the ICJ to get an order because Venezuela was um, conducting a referendum. And some of the questions in that referendum infringed on Guyana's sovereignty. So we approached the ICJ for an order against that, and that was granted. So all these all these things have taken up time that could have been spent towards dealing with the substantive issue before the court. So hence the matter is still being um, adjudicated. Mm. So tell us about the Essequibo region. Like how many people live there? We've heard that it's about two thirds of Guyana's landmass, but it is, is it uh, like a major population or economic center to your country? 
Um, I wouldn't say Ezequibo is a major population center. Most of our population in Guyana, how Guyana is set up, is um, focused on Demerara. However, Ezequibo is a major resource center for Guyana. Um, all of our natural resources are there. Gold, diamond, bauxite, trees, logging, and everything. In addition, our oil resources are um, offshore. Um, the maritime space is adjacent to Essequibo. So under the, um, the international law of the seas, um, any, any oil exploration that falls within 200 nautical miles of the coast belongs to that country. So all our oil um, exploration, stop of block and everything is within 200 nautical miles of the Essequibo coast. So yeah, Essequibo is, is very important to us. It, it's the, I would say it's the backbone of our economy. Mm -hmm. Naturally, all the natural resources are there. Um, so what is the mood like in Guyana right now? If you're Guyanese living in Guyana, is it a fearful atmosphere that Venezuela might invade? Are people nonchalant? How, what is the general sentiment on the ground? Well, um, for the most part, commercial businesses, all of these companies operating in Esquivel and so on, it's, it's been business as usual. Um, the government has been on the ground, the president visiting these communities, these border communities and so on, reassuring them. Um, and businesses have basically been approaching it as business as usual. Exxon released a statement a few days ago in which they basically said they're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, similar sentiments have been expressed by other companies and so on, the Canadian companies. We have several Canadian um, companies operating in the Esquivel. They're either digging for gold or they're exploring for oil. And based on what the Canadian High Commission has said, these companies are treating it as business as usual. However, um, the, the threat that Venezuela potentially um, poses to Ghana cannot be underestimated. So the government has been um, basically doing diplomacy and so on in order to get support for Ghana. And the world has generally been supportive of Ghana's um, cause. So, but what about the people? You mentioned businesses, but for general people, is there a, an atmosphere of fear or tension? Uh, um, communities closer to the border town would probably have some tension. Um, a lot of that tension has been um, assuaged by um, government officials going on the ground talking to people. Um, people closer to like Georgetown and so on, the major population centers of the country, um, that tension is less pronounced. Uh, they're going about their daily lives. If it was to come to military action, which essentially seems like what Venezuela is threatening, is Guyana prepared to defend itself militarily, as far as you know, as far as what the government officials are saying? Well, there, there are several schools of thought that um, uh, Venezuela is doing this uh, for political purposes, not necessarily to take military action. Um, as you know, Venezuela has an election next year. And as you know, Maduro, um, he, he, he's not looking very good in the polls. So there is a school of thought that um, this is basically to um, drum up support for his cause ahead of the elections and so on. Um, the Venezuelan opposition certainly have expressed that view. So, um, but in case it does come to military action, you know, Ghana has um, very strong alliances with the US. Um, US Southcom is currently collaborating with Ghana, um, doing training, shared training exercises and so on. We have close collaboration with Brazil, and we have close collaboration with other countries. So, but our Guyana's first line of defense has always been diplomacy, and that is what we're pursuing right now.
Yeah, CARICOM has also extended support to Guyana as well. But listen, I'm not surprised by anything you've just said because I'm from Belize and we have this exact same issue with Guatemala going back centuries and every election, every election, somebody bring up the claim from Guatemala re Belize and start claiming half the country, the whole country, the keys, every time. It's a, it really is a political issue. Yep, yep, um, exactly. And one that the politicians in those countries use to, to get people on their side to say, yes, we're going to go after yeah. our territorial quote unquote rights in these countries that, that we were supposed to have decades ago, if not for Spain and Britain and, you know, longstanding issues there. But let's look at the overall situation in Guyana. Now, Venezuela aside, the whole you know, oil situation, country discovered oil, billions of barrels of discover, uh, recoverable oil and you're now on track to become the fourth largest oil producing country in the world with projected growth of 38 percent for 2023 but is this something that people are feeling like is it just numbers being reported or do you actually see progress in guyana right now um well, take for instance this year. This year we had our largest budget in history, in the history of the country. Um, so definitely policies are being rolled out using the oil resources to benefit the people. Um, schools, education, um, health care, and so on, which are bread and butter issues, infrastructure, support for agriculture, and so on. Um, social also social services like um pensions and so on are being increased and so on um we were supposed to get free university education by 2025 so all of these are policies that would benefit the people nice i like that free university education within two years so like yeah. some people need to move to Guyana, <laughs> you're going to get some people uh, migrating on the CSME, uh, Jerry. Yeah, we're getting a lot of migration. All right, let me take some comments from the audience. We have some questions for you. Uh, Stronglink says, if Guyana knew that issue was over their head, they should, have not, they should not have gone for independence. Venezuela would not be messing with them. Remember what happened in the Falklands War? Britain would step in. So that 1966 agreement was the year that Guyana gained independence. Did that play, did this dispute with Venezuela play an issue, play a role in Guyana attaining independence? Um, Guyana had been pushing for independence um, for, for a while before that. Um, and I think Venezuela saw Guyana pushing for independence and probably decided to take advantage of the issue. Um, but at the same time, around that period, Ghana wasn't operating in isolation. There was a massive move across the Caribbean region, massive move in Africa and so on to push for independence from Britain. So, you know, in, they say hindsight is 50-50, um, but um, there was a massive move for independence that I don't think could have been delayed. Right. Well, so in Belize's case, that was the main thing that delayed our independence, because as you know, most of the Caribbean countries got independence in the 60s, including Jamaica. Belize didn't get independence till 1981 for the very same reason, because Guatemala kept threatening to invade. And small country that we are needed Britain's help to help defend against that threat from Guatemala. But they still, you know, threaten now and again. Next question comes from, well, it's a comment really, comes from Stronglink who says, ICJ can't do a thing. Venezuela will just ignore them, sad to say. So if you do get the results that you are expecting from the ICJ, what would that mean on the ground? Does that come with any type of uh, military support or what, other than words, what is it? Uh, ICJ decisions are actually enforceable by the UN Security Council. And incidentally, Ghana is expected to become, well, Ghana is, has already been elected to become a non permanent member of the um, UN Security Council for next year. So um, that's not necessarily true. 
I, ICJ decisions are enforceable by the UNSC. And additionally, you know, Ghana would have much more support with an ICJ decision in its favor from the world than it already has. You know, as it is, uh, Venezuela doesn't have any support for its position that Esequibo is, is, um, is their own. You know, they don't have any support. They have no evidence to substantiate that claim. So I, I would say an ICJ decision in our favor definitely helps. Francine says Venezuela is known for doing their thing and they're a bully. And then Chantel says, why do we as third world countries always look towards the USA for help? Because we're small, Chantel. Yes. <laughs> and we're yes. facing a much bigger foe. <laughs> Exactly. Lanestra has a question, read the economy and the oil fine. Lanestra says, there's a sense that the foreign companies in Guyana are benefiting more from Guyana resources than the general Guyanese people. What is your take on it? Um, that's, that's certainly a narrative. and It's not just limited to Guyana, you know, um, in any quote unquote third world country, um, there is that narrative that foreign companies benefit more than um, the local people. But if you look at, for instance, our local content laws, we have some of the most, some of the toughest local content laws um, of any oil producer in the world. And in fact, when we were implementing our laws, um, the oil companies weren't too happy about it. But um, we do have laws that um, are about areas that local people can benefit for instance um international companies they come together they have to find local partners um they have to supply their goods from locals they have to hire locals we have thousands of guys working in the oil and gas industry we have thousands of local suppliers who who supply exxon and these other companies and are paid and so on so we do have legislation to secure benefits for Guyanese. But hasn't there been controversy about the splits in the revenue with the lion's share going to the oil companies? Yes, yes, there has. Um, our, um, our 2016 agreement, um, I, a lot of exports are of the view that it wasn't a good agreement. Um, and actually, the local content laws were formed. Were form with the intention of, of undoing some of the damage caused by that agreement. Um, so yeah, I, I could definitely understand that view. And on the ground, the sentiment is generally supportive or most people vex about the agreement? Well, most people in Ghana are definitely upset with that agreement. Definitely. Um, but I don't think anyone who is looking at it from an unbiased perspective can say that efforts are not being made to um, kick some of the benefits, you know, um, push some of the benefits to Guyanese from the oil and gas industry, um, local, local content, um, um, local business development and so on, partnerships, a lot of our local companies are actually partnered with Exxon um, sub suppliers and so on, international companies coming to Ghana. So, yeah. Is there opportunity for that to be renegotiated? Well, the, the government's policy has been um, not negotiating the contract. Um, one of the one of the reasons for that is investor confidence. If um, if Ghana is to um, is to roll back on a contract, that can affect the momentum of investments. Right now, Ghana is getting a lot of um, investments, a lot of investors' interests, and so on. And um, rolling back that contract would negatively affect that. Um, what we have done. There is a new model contract in place that significantly improves um, any future oil deals that we would sign. And future oil deals will be signed because this year we auctioned some blocks. A bunch of companies came in and um, they bid for blocks and they were awarded blocks. So 
any future contracts that they sign with Guyana will be a um, hundred times better. Okay. Well, we look forward to hearing more about those details. Thank you so much for joining us, Gerald. Thank you for having me. And all the best to you. So to you, our viewers, yesterday I had my money marketing course. Actually, before we go to that clip, right now it's time for our poll question. So do you think that other CARICOM countries should assist Guyana in the dispute with Venezuela? Here are your options. And you can take this poll on Twitter or on the community tab of our YouTube channel. Yes, but not militarily. Yes, send troops to help. No, it's not our business. No, Venezuela is our ally. Or other, leave a comment. Do you think that CARICOM should assist Guyana in the dispute with Venezuela? Here are your options again. A, yes, but not militarily. B, yes, send troops to help. C, no, it's not our business. D, no, Venezuela is our ally. And E, other, just leave a comment and let us know what you think. So yesterday now, I had money marketing masterclass. It was lesson four, all about business. The topic was how to build a business using social media. Here's a quick look. And so Rihanna said, okay, what do people know me for? Well, I'm drop dead gorgeous, right? Nobody can deny Rihanna is an absolutely beautiful woman. Uh, people want to look like me. People want to emulate my beauty. And so she came up with Fenty Beauty with her inclusive shades. And Fenty Beauty, according to Forbes, is valued at $2.8 billion. She also has her collaborations with Puma, <coughs> Fenty, <coughs> Fenty X Puma. And of course, she has her Savage X Fenty line. So that's the other thing. You think of, about Rihanna, not only do you think about her, you know, her beautiful face, but one of the first things that comes to mind is sex appeal. You think Rihanna, you're like, that's a sexy woman right there. She has this, you know, this sex appeal. How do I, how does, and she probably went through the process of thinking, how do I package and sell my sex appeal? And she came up with this idea of doing a lingerie line, which has been so successful. They, last year it was reported that they were considering an IPO at a valuation of over $3 billion. So that's Rihanna using her influence to found and run two multi-billion dollar companies. So how can you do that? How can you use your own influence? What is it that is special about you that you can use to promote on social media? That is what we were discussing in Money Marketing last night. Make sure you check out that course. It's a four-part course. All four parts are now finished. Sorry if you missed the live, but we do have the replays available for you to watch uh, whenever you need to. And the important thing is how do you make money using social media? And that was just one example. As a celebrity example, we also had some non-celebrity examples in there as well. Well, up next, it's your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. The JC Combined Index lost over 3,000 points or 1% last week. 124 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending Friday, December 8, 2023. 46 made gains, 65 lost value, and 13 stayed the same. 71 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, valued at $453 million. Trans-Jamaican was last week's most traded stock, it took up 12% of market volume, with 9 million shares trading. The stock gained $0.02 cents to open the new week at $2.61. Wisinka traded the second highest. The stock lost $0.06 cents to open this week at $19.83. And Spurtree Spices rounded out last week's most traded, with 7 million shares changing hands. The stock lost $0.18 cents to open Monday at $2.11. Now let's see who are the biggest gains for the week. AMG Paper and Packaging was the market's biggest gainer. The stock was up 20% to open Monday at $2.65. Caribbean Cream had the second biggest gain last week. The stock was up 19% to close the week at $3.69.
and PBS 9.75% cumulative redeemable was up 16% to open the new week at $116.15. On the losing side now, Sibony was last week's biggest loser. The stock lost $0.47 cents to open Monday at $1.13. Margaritaville Turks USD was the week's second biggest loser, opening the new week at $0.11 cents US. And Cygnus Real Estate Finance USD lost 18% to close the week at $0.08 cents US. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the Composite Index lost 8 points, about 1% last week. NCB Financial was the most traded stock. The stock gained 15 cents to open this week at $3 TT. One Caribbean Media was the biggest gain of the week. The stock was up almost 8% to start the week at $3.79 TT. And on the losing side, Endeavor Holdings fell 11% to open Monday at $13.31 TT. Over in the U.S., the Dow Jones was mostly flat last week, while the S&P 500 was up almost 1%, and the Nasdaq was up almost 2%. Over at the pumps, gas prices dipped $3.06 last week, while diesel prices lost $4.50. In foreign exchange, it took an average $156.69 Jamaican to purchase one U.S. dollar last Friday. That's 74 cents more than the week before. Meanwhile, it took an average $115.01 Jamaican to purchase one Canadian dollar. One British pound cost on average $195.68 Jamaican. And you could buy one euro for $170.28 Jamaican on average. Finally, on the crypto markets, Bitcoin prices were down 4% over the past five days, trading at $41,905 US on Monday. Ethereum prices, on the other hand, fell 2%, trading at $2,226 US on Monday. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analyst, is brought to you by Profit Jump Starter. Disclaimer This is not intended as financial advice. Please consult a licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's time now for the analysts. For some reason, I feel like I haven't spoken to them in forever. So it's time to, to get with it. I'm joined by CEO of Profit Jump Starter, Keisha Bailey, and founder of Wealth Watch, J.A. Julian Marsden. Welcome, Keisha. Welcome, Julian. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you both. Winding down towards the end of the year. Can you believe 2023 is almost over? I hope everybody is checking your portfolios and seeing what's going on and what you accomplished this past year. Keisha, let's start with you. Uh, we have a nod this evening to investment icon Charlie Munger, who has passed away. Tell us who he was and how he changed the game. Sure. All right. So Charlie Munger, um, within the investment community, we know him as, you know, the GOAT. Um, he's the right on basically to Warren Buffett and together they built Berkshire Hathaway, which is one of the largest um, value investing um, holding companies. Warren Buffett being known for his value investing strategies and Charlie Munger being right beside him um, sharing in those principles as well. For context, um, Berkshire Hathaway's their share price now is $549,240 US per share. That's the A series of the shares. So very expensive stock to buy, but still um, over the, the history of the stock, it's consistently grown because of this, this value investing strategy that Berkshire Hathaway is known for. So Charlie Munger passed away recently, and I, I just wanted to you know pay homage to his great... Um, insights that he shared with the investing community. I personally have benefited a lot in my investing philosophy and how I see and approach investments just based on him and Warren Buffett. Um, so I wanted to share four lessons um, coming from him. Number one being the big money is not in the buying and selling, but in the waiting. I know Ooh. a lot of questions. Yeah, a lot of people are in the, the quick flip, the quick money. You know my position on that. I'm a true fundamentalist that, you know, I believe in finding solid companies and just holding on to them for the long term. That's really the strategy 
that Berkshire Hathaway has used as well, which has reaped millions, billions of dollars. The market cap for Berkshire Hathaway is 780 billion US. So a long-term strategy really pays off and that's what they've done. I guess point number two would be buy wonderful companies at fair prices. I know Black Friday just passed and everybody say, you know, seal out. We're going after a lot of things that we want to. I personally use that time for Christmas shopping because you, you get really good deals. But similarly with investing, it's the same thing. You want to buy wonderful businesses at fair prices. And I talk a lot about the great investing blueprint because it rests on the same principle of we find great companies and we buy them at great prices as well. That's value investing in essence. And then also great opportunities are rare. So, you know, most times we may think that, you know, oh, this sounds so good. And then next week, something else sounds so good. And then the week after that, something else again sounds so good. But in fact, great opportunities are rare. You're not going to see them every day. And the fact that you may be seeing something every day just means it's not great. And then it may just not be for you. That investing opportunity isn't for you. And also good businesses are ethical businesses. Uh, we're seeing a lot these days where a lot of companies are being drawn up in lawsuits, lots of um, business practices being called out, but you can't ever go wrong by investing in ethical companies. So I just kind of wanted to leave those lessons there and just thank Charlie Munger for everything he's done for the global investing community. Yeah, I absolutely love those, especially that first one. The real money is not in the buying and selling, yeah. the everyday trading. That's the quick money, but the real money is in the waiting. And we always say that, have patience. Yep. Have patience. You got to be in it for the long haul, 10 years plus. Yep. Minimum 10 years. All right, Thank Julian, you. we're looking at one of those long-time companies, Coca-Cola, their results are out. What are we looking at for Coca-Cola this year? So Coca-Cola, for their nine months, September. We're barely hearing you, Julian. I don't know what's going on with your audio. One sec. Yeah. Better? Yes, that's the side yes. with the mic. <laughs> you had in the wrong side. Why, Kalila, you have to roast me like this. <laughs> okay, so the um the company is not doing badly at all. So as at their nine months ended September 2023, um, net profit after tax is up 16.4% year over year, while revenue is up 6.2% um, year over year. So that big gap has a lot to do with not just revenue growth across segments, but the fact that the company has maintained its operating efficiency, especially improving its gross profit margins. So the company has been able to manage its input costs and last year would have seen much higher commodity costs across the board, specifically around food items, things related to sugar, things related to inputs that would be imported. But as supply chains have been relaxed, what we found is that companies like Coca-Cola have been able to get better gross profit margins and that fed right through to the bottom line of the company. In terms of the health of its capital, the company is rated um, A grade by Fitch Ratings Agency with a stable outlook. So it's not just a company that's doing well in terms of profit and loss, but its capital base is also healthy. In terms of the operating segments, North America is still a leading segment, not just in terms of growth, but in terms of the market that carries the company as it relates to sales, followed by Latin America, then Asia. But just to add some additional color around what Coca-Cola does, the company covers brands such as Fanta, Fanta, sorry, Fanta, Shrips, Sprite, and Minute Maid. And in terms of partnerships, the fast food chains that carry Coca-Cola includes McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Subway, TGI Fridays, Domino's Pizza, and Chick-fil-A. So it actually has more fast food partnerships than its nearest competitor, which is Pepsi. And Coca-Cola is different from Pepsi also in that Coca-Cola is more dominant in the U.S. than in international markets, while Pepsi is bigger in international markets than in the, than in the U.S. So in terms of the stock, the price is at $59. 
the PE is 23.9 times, and that's cheap for a return on equity of 41%, which means that the company is very productive and efficient in terms of its operating performance. And at the price of 23, um, a multiple, the valuation of 23.9 times, um, that's fair. How it has performed year over year, it's actually down 7.7% year over year. It's down 6.6% year to date. And in relation to the 200 day moving average, it's flat. However, the stock has been on the move in the last 50 days, being up 5.6% um, relative to the 50 day moving average. So the stock is on the move, even though it has been down year over year and year to date. And the dividend yield is 3.08%. So it's a good dividend opportunity, especially compared to the rest of the S&P 500. It has a strong track record, strong partnerships, and it's doing well year over year. So Coca-Cola is justified in Warren Buffett's portfolio to this day. Mm, it feels like Coca-Cola is one of those companies that just people just never stop drinking Coke. But then again, <laughs> who knows? The world is changing. People are seeking healthier lifestyles. Yeah, that's know true. When that, that flip might switch. That's true. Well, the good thing is the company also carries brands like Powerade, and they have their own water brands. So, I believe that Coca Cola is likely to continue investing in brands that are not as concentrated in sugary drinks that are unhealthy, as we know. And I anticipate that the brand will continue to invest in these lines that are more in line with where health, trend, health trends are going as you, as you identified. Mm, okay. Keisha, I have a question for you. Well, it's really a comment from Andre Brown. Andre says, I have a different take on long-term investing due to experience. I've owned Ford stocks for over 11 years with minimal returns. Having Tesla would have been a better investment for a growing company. What do you say to Andre? Well, I mean, I, I don't really know what, he would, what um, time he would have bought Ford. Um, 11 years ago right but has he bought at a high point at that time like the highest point in that gotcha. period so a lot of people chase stocks when they're going to buy it after it's run up and then they're buying it and yes he's held it for 11 years but has he taken advantage of downturns and average down his price likely not um with tesla yes looking at it um it's new innovative technology and that theme of you know um, electric vehicles has been a rapidly growing area. But the, the thing is, just having the Ford stocks, I have seen the average for 11 years, fine. But were you averaging down? Were you consistently buying each month? Probably not. Um, similar thing would have to happen with Tesla as well. One company, however, is more of a growth company than the other. So that too, right? Ford is just now talking about. Um, launching more electric vehicles that that was tesla's entire business model to begin with so two different um companies one very mature so slower growth one new and innovative so it would be faster growth right and you don't you don't just want to <clears throat> buy and hold for buying and hold sake because warren buffett said buy and hold you do want to look for opportunities right but buy and hold also does not mean buy one time hold forever it means buy through dollar cost averaging and make sure that your price it, it goes he spoke about the price as well ensuring that you have great pricing on the stock so it's not just buy and leave it alone you have to manage the price at which you bought that comes through dollar cost averaging another comment and i'll ask julian to respond to this one this comment comes from roswell it's not the one roswell says value investing is a good way to build up your equity Stock market is trading low, and these prices we won't see in four years forward. Now is the time to buy. Do you agree with that, Julian? <laughs> Sakisha, nodding vigorously, like, yes, she agrees. What do you think? Yeah, definitely across the board. I think that we're seeing some of the best bargains available in the last four years, at least. Five, we could even go as far as saying five years because it goes back to the interest rate story. So, interest rates now are much higher than it would have been over the last five years. And what happens with interest rates is that as they rise, the prices of stocks and bonds tend to fall. So what we are seeing is that classical relationship between the two, i.e. stocks and bonds with interest rates, 
So because of that, we're getting a wider menu of bargains across the board, across sectors, across markets. So investors are able to, by now, um, get in at better entry points now because there's going to be a time when interest rates um, enter a different cycle and move in a different direction. And with that, stocks and bonds are intended to, are likely to um, rise again with that inverse relationship. So it's only a matter of time. But the key is to buy smart because we can't buy junk at a cheap price and expect the junk to move. Mm -hmm. um, not saying Ford is junk, but for argument's sake, Ford has faced a lot of operational challenges. So for instance, the US market, which is Ford's stomping ground, has taken on to Japanese cars big time. So Toyota, Honda, and those brands, if you notice, those cars are actually, even the sedans, they've been getting bigger and bigger. It's to cater to the American market. So what you find is that Ford has been losing market share over the last 11 years. So it's deeper than just Tesla and the disruption on the EV side. So it's really about starting at buying quality, then buying quality at a price that is attractive so that we can maximize our return. Next comment is also for you, Julian. Who am I says, I'm on the hunt for companies stock price under 25 US a share, value underpriced companies. What do you think about that strategy? Well, the interesting thing is if your budget is 25 US per share, you'd have to ask what exactly are you paying for? Because we don't just look at prices in a vacuum. We look at the earnings per share, the book value per share, and other metrics to identify if that $25 is justified to see, as you said, whether or not it's, it's overvalued or undervalued. So one stock can be $25 and it's overvalued based on how much profit per share it generates. And another stock can be $25 or even less, right? Um, and it's telling a totally different story based on the earnings per share. So two stocks can have the same price. One is ex one is overvalued, one is undervalued because one is generating more profit per share than the other. So it really comes down to what is that price in relation to? Are we getting that for a good bargain because the company is very profitable? Or are we getting that at a weaker value proposition because the company is not profitable? And even if it's not profitable, there might be something else moving it. Is it that there is innovative technology that has gotten regulatory approval and that regulatory approval is likely to take effect in the next three months, which should open market share. So even though there's no profit, the regulatory story is likely to carry the company into a different phase. So all these things that we're discussing are called catalysts and investments need catalysts because even if a company is profitable, and it doesn't have a catalyst, then the price is not likely to move. A catalyst is a fancy word, but it's simply something that's a trigger that's likely to cause the price to move. So we need to identify our groundwork, how profitable is the company, how well do we understand it, does it have a catalyst, and understand how it trades. All of those things come together that um, should form our investment thesis. Okay. Last question comes from Shelly Ann. I don't know how closely either of you have been following the news with Edgy Focal. It was in What's Hot earlier. Shelly Ann wants to know what's the analysts think about Edgy Focal's planned stock split at 161? Anybody want to take it? Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been following sure. it closely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm not, I, I don't have the full terms of the split but I can talk about Edifocal a bit because I think the company is in its early growth phase, meaning that based on the type of business model it has, it, it should see its best days further down the line because the company is just taking off in terms of its growth. It's basically a technology company. So it's more similar to a Tesla for argument's sake because we were mentioning Tesla in the earlier um conversation so it's more like a tesla than a ford in terms of its life cycle so this company is likely to see its best days ahead because it's still in the innovation phase it's still disrupting a traditional business model which is in class um tutoring so more so um we expect the value to come more from the business model taking off and maturing over time than 
are split in one specific period versus another. The benefit, however, is that Edifocal, Edifocal tends to have a core audience. So there are persons who believe in Edifocal and hold on to Edifocal, and it allows Edifocal to trade a specific way. So that creates a price floor. So if anybody is going to sell it, then there's an audience that is willing to buy because of that core following. And those two things combined is good. It's, 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 it's a good thing to have. Um, a core audience, which is a catalyst, as I mentioned just a while ago. And of course, the fact that your business model is still in a young phase. And it has shown proof of concept. So it has been profitable in the past. And there is proof of demand. And there is proof of concept and the leadership is experienced. So all these things combined actually um, should extend the longer term expectations around the stock as opposed to where a split is going to be in the period. But I think the split is inconsequential to the things that we just mentioned a while ago. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your input, Julian. Thank you once again. Keisha, I'll probably see you again next year. Yeah. Oh, I think the last taking stock. Next week is our last taking stock for the year. For the year. So okay, I'll see you okay. again next year. Yeah, thanks All a lot. Right. Enjoy again. your holidays. 2024. Thank you. Same to you. In 2024. Later, guys. Okay, so let's take our final break and come back with your comments. This segment of Taking Stock, the analyst, was brought to you by Profit Jump Starter. This is one of the top requests I get every single day, and I always say no. Kalila, do you do one-on-one -on -one consultations? Well, let me tell you why I say no. For me to be able to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, I'd have to charge at least 500 US, and that's actually very low because I already know I can make a lot more than that in an hour. Now, most of you aren't willing to pay that, so I just don't bother offering it. But this Christmas, I'm giving you a gift. Sign up for Money Mission Premium between now and New Year's and get a free 30-minute private consultation with me. Let's discuss business, marketing and investment strategy. But FYI, I can't recommend individual stocks because I'm not your financial advisor. Check the comments for the sign-up link. Let's get this money. Unheard of. I don't do private consultations, but I'm doing it just between now and new year's well i'm not sure if, well yeah if you purchase money mission premium between now and new year's you get a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one private consultation which would typically cost minimum of 500 and i really think that's actually low but you get it free with money mission premium so check the link below and sign up for money mission and you get get your private one-on-one -on -one consultation with me now we have some comments that i wanted to go over let me see keisha said uh, who am i says keisha please give me a, <laughs> a christmas stocking full of stocks uh, we had some earlier ones as well shelly and that was the one uh, Shelly Ann said that we need to interview Gordon Swaby. I already asked him like weeks ago when I saw the news come out that they were planning an APO. I asked him, I'm like, do you want to do it? And he said, yeah, he'll be in touch when the time comes. Devon says, you need to interview SOS CEO. I see more and more of their containers here in Cayman. Interesting. Stationary and office supplies. Okay. Very, very interesting. Andre says, one also needs a damn good marketing agency to rise to Rihanna's level. That is true. That is a fact. But like I said, Rihanna and other celebrities aren't the only examples I used in the course, right? So look at somebody like Mr. Beast, who rose to fame on YouTube. I didn't know Mr. Beast was only 25 years old. 25 years old. Last year. Is it last year or this year? This year, he is Forbes' top creator of 2023 bringing in an estimated 82 million US dollars. And a lot of that actually is not just from YouTube direct monetization, but actually from ventures that he's involved with. So he has his direct YouTube check. He also gets paid as an influencer and through affiliates. But the thing that I was looking at in last night's lesson was the businesses that he's established. So Mr. Beast has his merchandise line. I have my merchandise line, by the way. Mr. Beast also has energy bars. He also has a restaurant chain. He's involved in many different business ventures that he uses his influence to help sell. Anyway, moving right along, who am I says 10 years? 
referring to when I said, do you want to buy and hold for a minimum of 10 years? You want to look at long-term investment? Absolutely. We had more of that conversation just now with Keisha and Julian regarding the strategy involved with long-term investing. It's not just buy and sit on and do the nothing for 10 years, but you want to have to look at companies that have a long-term time horizon, that have growth potential over a minimum of 10 years, not just a passing fad. Shelly Ann says, Kalila, <laughs> you guys have jokes. How are y'all going to use your sex appeal to make money online? Only fans <laughs> enter the chat. Oh, you got jokes, you got jokes, you got jokes. And Rihanna didn't have to do her only fans to make money online. She found another way to use her sex appeal to make money, to, to package that. Another example I gave was Kim Kardashian. She has the body. That's one of the things that a lot of people want. You look at Kardashian, you want the Kardashian body, you want the hourglass figure. Um, some will say it's surgery. Whether or not it is, she came up with this way to package and sell that figure, which is her brand Skims. And so now all the Kardashians have very, very lucrative businesses. You have at least two of them have billion dollar companies, Skims and Kylie Cosmetics. And they're using their influence now to sell their own merchandise, to sell their own products. As opposed to five years ago, when you used to hear about the Kardashians getting paid a million dollars a post, they're now using their influence, instead of using it to sell other people's stuff, they're using it to sell their own things. So that was the interesting part of the discussion in money marketing last night. Learn, grow, invest says Mr. Beast is a beast. He absolutely is. And he does a lot of philanthropy. I, I truly believe that because he is so philanthropic, what he gives, he gets back in folds and droves. And that, that tends to happen amongst people who, who give a lot. Anestra said, Mr. Beast age like his YouTube channel. <laughs> Y'all got jokes. Uh, what else do I have here? Andre. Yes, the stock need to be consistent at a certain level, not just one day. Okay, well, that is it for today. I shall see you again next week. Hopefully, I see you inside Money Mission for our webinar, Surviving Christmas and January. I feel like I should rename it Surviving January because MAGA season is upon us. When you don't spend up all the Christmas money, you have nothing left. And January is the longest month of the year by far. January has like, 60 days in it, waiting for that January paycheck. Be like, oh, link me next week, Monday, Inside Money Mission for surviving Christmas and surviving January. We're going to make a plan to get through it. Until then, guys, I shall see you and be safe this holiday season. And of course, let's get this money. Bye. This money. <laughs> <laughs>